Hello and welcome to another Solana tutorial. This is part 4 of the Solana development course. Today we're gonna serialize custom instruction data. My name is Andy. I don't have a professional green screen or lighting setup, but we're gonna do this anyway. I think at this point I don't need any more introduction, do I? Like, we do this, you know how this works, you code alongside me, and we're gonna learn together. Ha! Let's go, and I'm gonna piss right off into this corner. So, what are we gonna learn today, James? We're gonna be able to explain the contents of a transaction, okay? And the transaction instruction, I mean, didn't we already do this? Explain the basics of Solana runtime optimization. Oh, that is interesting. And explain Borsch. Okay, so that is, yeah, okay. There we have the interesting parts. I think I can also learn something here, James. I like this. Use Borsch to serialize custom instruction data. Okay, yes, let's do it. What is the TLDR? And I'm gonna read. Nah, do I read myself? I think I wanna make James read. There is one reason. We're gonna read ourselves a bit. Okay, so as we already discussed in I think part two, or maybe part three. A transaction consists of instructions. So far so good. They are executed in order. So first instruction, then second instruction, then third instruction, and so on. If any of them fails, the entire transaction fails. Only if they all succeed, the transaction goes through and state is actually changed. We already had that. Next point, every instruction is made up of three components, also that we already touched upon in a previous video. I think it was part two. It's the program ID, the list of accounts, and a byte buffer of instruction data. Also that is nothing new to us. And now each transaction contains an array of accounts, which is the set union, is that the right word? If I have two things and I want all of them, then it's the union, right? And that's nothing else than the union of all the accounts that are involved in transactions, uh, in instructions. All of the accounts that are used in the instructions, we need to name them up front in the transaction with the flags of whether or not we want to write to them and whether or not they're a signer. Each transaction also needs to have one or more instructions. Obviously you can't have a transaction without any instruction and a recent block hash. Now this is new. Why do we need that? Well, that's for how Solana works. <laughs> Great explanation, Andy. Thank you very much. Essentially each block because we are dealing with a blockchain here. Solana is a blockchain. Each block has a hash, which represents the block, right? If you want to look at the block and put it in the Explorer with a block hash, you'll find the block. But anyway, in order for your transaction to be valid, it needs to include a recent block hash. And that's just for the validators to check if it's been in the last, I don't know how many blocks, then this transaction is still valid. Otherwise, it's an old transaction or an invalid transaction for other reasons, and it should not be executed anymore. And of course we need one or more signatures per transaction. So all of the accounts that were marked as signers, we need their signatures, which is essentially just a cryptographic blah, 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 whatever, not so important. This is just a TLDR, not the all detail here. In order to pass instruction data from a client, it must be serialized into a byte buffer. Now. Since there is all of that information in a transaction, we somehow need to represent it neatly to send to the RPC and then to the validator. And since we're dealing with a computer system here, it's all just bits and bytes, but it's bits and bytes ordered in a certain way, right? What's the real definition of serialized? In my head, it's like serializable is we are able to put it in like a line of data. So serial, one after the other. It's serialized. Past tense, serialized. Past participle, serialized. <laughs> Publish or broadcast a story or play in regular installments. No. Arange, so meeting in a series. Arange submit. No, first of all, we, we need an English voice. Arrange something in a series. There. Arrange something in a series. To serialize just means arrange it in a series. 
serious lies. In this case, we arrange bytes into a byte buffer. Not that hard, right? It's just we arrange some bytes. So simplest example, if we have a program ID and like a parameter, then if we serialize that, then we can say, oh, the program ID comes first and then comes the parameter, then this is now serialized. It's not the other way around and it's not randomly and it's not nothing, it is the exact order. And serializing data actually is very important when it comes to Solana development, because as we will learn, all of the accounts are also essentially just a bunch of data. And if you want to store anything on them, you need to serialize it properly. Yeah, okay, good. We define serialize. And to do the serialization, we will be using Borsch, which is a binary serialization for security critical projects. It's a library that helps us to serialize. Cool. Next, transactions can fail to be processed by the blockchain for any number of reasons. Well, there are a lot of reasons for it. <laughs> yes, yes. We'll discuss some of the most common ones here. Okay, so I mean, that's not a TLDR, that's a outlook. Okay, cool. Overview, let's dig in deeply. I have something in my eye. So, nah, James. Transactions are how we send information to the blockchain. Last time I edited this, I had to pff, squeeze it. So this time you're just gonna talk fast, James, okay? Try again. Transactions are how we send information to the blockchain in order to be processed. Mm -hmm. Transactions and the programs they are sent to can be designed to be far more flexible and handle far more complexity than we've dealt with up to now. No shit, James, no shit. It can be more complex than this. That should now just be a repetition. The library builds the array of accounts based on that information and handles the logic for including a recent block hash. Ha, so this is interesting. When we use Web3, we only need to ever deal with the accounts that are used for the instructions, since the accounts for the transaction are just the union of all those accounts. And Solana Web3 can then automatically calculate that. It also deals with getting a recent block hash and putting that into the transaction before you hit it off to the network. So yeah, using the Web3 JS is uh, helpful. But if you want to know how to do it without that, we also did that in part two. Every instruction contains and this should just be a repetition. Wait, let me check if that's actually just repetition. Yeah, here we saw that. An array of keys, public key for the program, and an optional buffer containing data. That's what we have here. Program, accounts, instruction data. Right, so this entire paragraph is just a summary of what we did in part two. Like I already talked about that in part two, I'm not gonna do that again. Gonna speed through this today. Instruction data. So this paragraph basically just says, you are responsible for how your instruction data looks, right? Cause it's just bytes. Once again, you need to define the serialization and you need to deserialize it correctly. Each program, however, only has one entry point. This is also a good point. Each program only has one entry point. So if we want to use different instructions within one program, then we need to also pass that somehow as instruction data to the program. Simplest way of doing this is using the first byte to indicate which instruction to run. And really, since it's just only one entry point, it really just is one big instruction, but then it behaves differently. So we say that it's different instructions. Really conceptually, it's one. Anyhow, when using Anchor, it's easier to abstract that away. Let's not, let's not be too picky here. It's different instructions <laughs> to make life easier. You would also include in the instruction data any information the function needs in order to execute properly. So in the instruction data, you would essentially put everything else that you do not already have in the accounts. Because obviously if you already have the list of accounts for your instruction and you can deserialize that, then you don't need to put those public keys as additional instruction data anymore because it's already in the accounts. But anything that is not in the accounts, you need to pass as instruction data. Simplest example, system program transfer instruction we have the sender and the recipient as accounts, so we don't need to put them as instruction data, but we definitely need the amount of Lamperts as instruction data since we cannot find this anywhere in the accounts. And the instruction should behave differently depending on how many Lamperts you want to send, right? 
It should do something different. It should take that as input and then behave differently. Because instructions essentially are just functions. Like you can just think of instructions as a function of the program, like in classic computer science terms. It's just, it's a thing, it takes parameters and it has a return value. And the return value is whether or not it succeeded. So it either goes okay or it fails. And it can also write data to some uh, storage, which in that case are accounts. So in that analogy, you can think of accounts as like pointers that you give to the function. Pointers to places in the storage. Okay, moving on. But it's common to have the first field in instruction data be a number that the program can map to a function. That's all we said. After which additional fields act as function arguments. Yeah, so this says essentially what I just said. The first field in instruction could be like an identifier for which function to call, and then the rest arguments for that function. Okay, let's go serialization. Serialization, binary object representation serializer for hashing. It is meant to be used. Okay, I learned something. I learned the acronym for Borsch. There are also other packages built on top of Borsch to try to make this process even easier. And here we finally find some code. We're gonna use Project Serum Borsch library and we're gonna define some stuff. Let's get to the code, to the code. We just gonna copy this. And in order for this to work, we need to have Project Serum Borsch installed. So we're gonna just npm install this. Okay, Borsch. Apparently it doesn't like you 256 anymore. Here we can see what nice things we can serialize. We can have floats, we can have integers, map options, public keys, vectors, unsigned integers, signed integers. And it doesn't like bigger integers though, but last published eight months ago. So this like is the newest version. Yay, yay, yay. Always the problem with libraries. And this time we're not even dealing with front end. The one thing that you learn here is that Solana development still is chewing glass. It's tough. Let's see if that's actually a problem or just my VS code telling me it's a problem. It's actually a problem. I mean, the easiest fix, <laughs> I could do stuff like that. That will work now. It's by far not as nice, but it's pretty much the same. And uh, I don't know how else to fix this now. So I'm just gonna do the quick and dirty solution because I wanna move on. That's that, what do we do here? Essentially, we just define how our schema looks, right? We do one U8, one U16, and one U4, two U128. You can then encode, James. You can then encode data using the schema with the encode method. This method accepts as arguments and object reference. Well, let's try that. We allocate a new buffer that's much larger than what we need, then we encode the data into that buffer, and then we slice it down to the new buffer that's only as large as needed. I don't know why you do it that complicatedly and not set it right in the beginning, but maybe just to learn. Yeah, maybe just to learn. So we don't use semicolons. Create a buffer. With, oh yeah, you don't see my, just remember that you don't see my mouse in here. Out here you see it, right? Here you still see it, but then if it goes in here, it doesn't. So what I need to do is do a lot of this because I don't know how else to fix that. Right, so we create a buffer, just a thousand bytes. And then we use this schemer with dot encode, that's like one of the functions in Borsch. And then we give it this thing as an object where we say, this should map to this, this should map to this, and this, well, two to the power of 128. I mean, that's by far big enough for this kind of a number, even a 32 bit integer. Anyway, we're just gonna use one because we wanna make it easier on ourselves and just not have it that big. And then this will map onto here and then code will write it into the buffer. See, like stuff gets deprecated so quickly. I feel like James just released those tutorials and it's already out of date. I don't have documentation on this, but uh, I'm pretty sure this just gets the number of bytes for this Borsch struct. 
So we just slice it down to the length that we need, which in our case will be one plus two plus, ah, oh, mathematics is so hard. 64 is eight, 128 is 16, 16 bytes. So one plus two plus 16 is 18. Mathematics is so hard. So if we just do this and print it, we would expect 18 or an error. Like this should be for beginners and I'm a beginner, but still it's difficult. Borsch doesn't like that. I hate my life sometimes. I just fucking hate, I just, I just wanted to see 19. I can't calculate. Hold on, let's make that calculation on bits then. Eight plus 16. 8 plus 16 plus 128 is 152 divided by 8 is 9. What? Did I miss? <laughs> Did I mess up a primary school? Yes, I, I, I did mess up a primary school exercise. What is 16 plus 1 plus 2? Because that's not 18. It's 19. Stupid man. Stupid. Okay. Never mind, it's 19 and that's correct. Cool, I can, I get it. I get it, I get it, but I don't get why this is not working. Why you no use encode? Ah, <sighs> James, your course is frustrating. Can I somehow find the types for this? Buffer layout in V122. Two two and buffer layout. We want to two. Also have that. <sighs> I don't get it. Encode. Source is a big what? Source you expect to be a binary number. I would really like to have types. Can can, can I install types? So, but anyway, from reading source code, we get smarter. This should be a BN. A BN. So this should be a BN. Or it thinks that is a BN. No. Yes. Okay, we, we're gonna dig deeper here because we can. So my question is, where does this issue come from? Probably from this one. Fail to load bindings. Never mind that. Let's see if it is the problem. Okay, so it was just this number that it somehow interpreted as a big int because it is a big int, but then it didn't use a big int and that's where my issue came in. Are we gonna try and make it work with a big int? No, but it needs to be a BN, BN from here, there. Function BN number base endian number base BN is equals BN. Oh, do I need to understand? But does this two array like? Yeah, this has a two array like. So this is the thing I need. Do I even include this correctly? Oh, see, oh that. Okay, let's do it like the usage suggests here. It's a hex number. And if I don't want that hex number, but I just want like the thing we had earlier, I put here the seven something something and base 10, put all of this in here. Does that work now? No, still, still decline. Yeah, okay, okay, classic, didn't save. Try again. Boom, ha, okay, that works. Complicated AF, but hey, it works now. Ha, huh. only took us, I don't know how long. Never mind. We, I'm gonna get through your course, James. I'm gonna get through it, even if it's tough. I'm gonna get through that course. We are gonna get through that course together, right? Person watching, the one person watching this video. <laughs> it's getting late as well. But never mind. I don't get late, so that's. Uh, I don't know. Insert joke here. Um. Anyway, now that this is done, we can continue with slicing, <laughs> which is deprecated. But does it work? Yes, okay, even if it's deprecated, as long as it works, but we can quickly check if we have something instead, subarray, that also returns a buffer. 
So in my head, returns a new buffer that references the same memory as the original. Ah, okay, no, no, no. And was the docs for slice? Returns a new buffer that references the same memory as the original. That is the same. I thought that maybe one copies it over and one doesn't. But anyway, like, I, I still don't get why we would even, like, create an extra large buffer instead of just, I don't know, putting that number here. Oh, right, be because we don't have buffer? What does that do again? Right. Okay, I, I start to get it. See, because... Like, this can be, like, not fixed values, right? We could just put in a string of variable length or an option or whatever, right? Because, you know, Borsch has other things. Vectors, variable length, options, variable length. And therefore, we can't know how long the data actually is unless we have the data. So we need to make a bigger buffer and then later see how much data we put in. Now it starts to make sense for me, okay. Because with three integer numbers where we know the size, this didn't make sense. But now, it does. You're welcome for explaining. Now you also understand. And still, I think subarray might be what you want to call that it's not deprecated. So let's just do this, okay? We also learned that that gives us 19, so we don't need that anymore. Cool. Now <laughs> we can finally move on. All that's left is building that transaction. Easy. Now finally we get to the easy stuff again. This is similar to what we've done in previous lessons. Yes, it is. Look at the part two. I'm really a fan of part two, let's be honest. I am a fan of part two. You should totally watch that if you haven't already. The example below assumes that already defined is a user's public key system program will be used to process the executing instruction i mean it doesn't quite that's what the code would look like i also don't want to go over this like in too much detail the instruction it creates with new transaction instruction because again we do it manually as we did in part two you know we don't have that defined and we don't have that defined but you get the idea that this one is writable, that's the account, and this one is just a signer. The only really interesting part is that we have the data here. And looking back, if you remember part two, that's what we did here. We also created a transaction instruction, and here we had the data, the instruction data, which we were just creating from a buffer, like manually writing it into a buffer. Only difference is that now, we don't manually do that, but we use a Borsch schema to encode some data to make that a bit easier. Especially if you have variable length, this is getting complicated. And since this wouldn't work anyway, there's no point in making it work. Point is we can put that buffer here. That's, that's already, like, I'm happy with that. I don't need to execute that code. But let's go to the demo. Let's actually practice this together. Yes, James. By building a movie review app that lets users submit movie reviews. Okay. We'll build this app little by little over the next few lessons. As long as I don't need to do the front end, I'm good. The public key of the Solana program for this application is this. Download the starter code. We have another Next.js application. Oh, nice. So, starter code. Making sure that we also go to the starter branch. Movie front end. Now we have the movie front end here. Check out starter, switch to new branch starter. This is the stuff that we know from lesson three. Remember the one where I had almost a mental breakdown? Oh, I also had that this one. Okay, cool. Yep, seems familiar. But uh, what we definitely need to do is run npm install. Once again, download all of the packages again. So that's pretty much all given and we also already have the right program id in here okay you've installed now please tell me that i can just run dev and it works compiled client and server successfully well that looks uh, sounds good what do we see here oh yes that's nice looks good good branding i like it is that already what i should see or am i just not on the starter i'm not sure Anyway, let's see 
what step two says, create the buffer layout. You need to know how it expects the data to be structured. It's expecting the instruction data to contain. So the program, we don't really know the program, but the, the dev of the program, because we are now the front end devs, damn it. The dev told us, I expect the variant, then the title, then the rating, then the description. And that's how it's supposed to look like, right? An 8-bit, a string, an unsigned 8-bit integer, another string, the variable length. Let's configure a Porsche layout in the movie class. Let's see if that's already done. Yeah, no, that's not done. Okay, so we wanna do this together. Cool, let's do it together. We wanna import this library. Okay, so far so good, that still works. Okay, okay, okay. Then we wanna define the schema. Well, I mean, you already hinted all of that and I have the tendency to just copy it. I, I have, you know, it's just, I should have stopped reading here, right? And be like, hey, can you make this into the movie class? And not scroll any further, because if I just copy code, I will not learn. Thus, we ignore that we just uh, saw this and we're gonna attempt to do it without. So all the information we have is this. Let's pretend. We start with a variant. So, <laughs> so, uh, uh, we wanna have a Borsch struct. So how did that go? Well, that's first of all, not how you spell it. I kind of want to cheat. I kind of want to cheat. It's okay to look at somewhere where you've already done it before. Oh, I was right so far. Cool. Okay, but then it requires a list. See, if I had, if I had the types for this, it would be so much easier because then I would see what this takes. Let's just accept that we need a list of Borsch things. So, Borsch.u8. And then I think was the name, right? So variant, then Porsche dot title is a string rating description. String rating. And we can call this as we want. We can call this, but it's a U rating out of five. <laughs> so of course, yeah, we call it stars, five stars. And something is still not right. My Porsche schema. Oh, okay, that was the thing that was missing. Oh, because we're in the class here. Okay, well, I mean, then we just define it like that, many, maybe? I know my JavaScript. Of course I know my JavaScript. Yeah, but that's that. Um, and it's exactly what is written here, right? Right, right, right? Hmm? Yeah, except four stars. Four stars. Keep in mind that order matters. Yes, yes, yes. Same as size, order matters. Because in order for properties, oh no, that's not even what he says. If the order of properties have different, then a transaction will fail. Yes, because it's serialized. Therefore, it has to be in a series. This series has to be Defined and it's the same. It needs to have the same series. It has to have the same order. Ah, okay. So far, so good. Now let's create a method to serialize that data. Now that we have the buffer layout set up, let's create a method in movie called serialize to make the movie serializable. That will return a buffer with a movie object. Okay, that's all the description that I will take and I will do it by myself. I will do it by myself and give you a serialize function. Doesn't take any parameters and it returns a buffer. Now, how do we get to a buffer? Well, first of all, we make a temporary buffer, a new buffer and we, uh, yeah, you like buffer from alloc. Okay, you like buffer alloc. And we didn't discuss how long the title and the description can be because with the U8s we know how long it is, but we need to put some kind of restriction on the size of those two strings. So we could say the title cannot be longer than 300 characters and the description cannot be longer than, I don't know, 3000 characters. I don't know how long you want to write your descriptions because 
Later on, if we want to store that in accounts, we also need to allocate the size of the account. So it would make sense to, to make a restriction on that because otherwise I would need to allocate an infinitely big buffer here, which obviously doesn't work. So let's say we allocate one plus 300 plus one plus 3000. Those would be our max sizes. And then we can serialize the actual data that we want to serialize. Wait, hold on. Oh yeah, that's the, hold, that's the data that we want to serialize. Okay, cool. Where will we get the instruction from? You will have to deal with the instruction manually yourself. Or I will, I will put in the right value, whatever my value is. Let's go with my schema and encode. I would really love to see what I could put here. Right? I think this was the what goes where. So variant would be, let's say one, if in our program, the variant would have second instruction. Like if we were to call the second instruction with that, that's, that's maybe, or, or, or we'd have the first instruction. That, again, that's up to us how we did that. So, and I don't know, like I, I need to talk to my dev again. I'm just a front end guy. He needs to specify that better. But anyway, the title, the title is this dot title. I'm going to put that into a new line. The description is this dot description. And here I could change the order, right? Here I could put the description after the title and put the stars, stars at the very end is this dot rating, right? I can do that in any order because the encoding will then ensure that it has this order. Yeah, so that's the encode and we want to encode it into a buffer. I take it back. We want to encode it into our temporary buffer. Okay, and then we want to again const my buffer because <laughs> I'm so creative. Want to use the temp buffer and subarray it from the start to the length of the temp buffer, so that would be my Porsche schema dot get span. Oh, you don't even see that anymore because my head is too big from buffer. No, temp buffer. Okay, I think that's good now. Then, yeah, since that's my code, I'm gonna do that, okay? And then we return my buffer. I mean, I think that is good now. Save it and check how well we did. So serialize returns a buffer. We alloc, we encode, and then we slice or subarray. I think it's the same, I'm not entirely. However, James did it a lot nicer because he was just like, dot 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 this because James contrary to myself is a pro JavaScript dev and he knows that the dot 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 this t just takes those things and flattens them but I think it will also use this and flatten it just that the encode doesn't care about it because it doesn't have that in any of those so it will just ignore it but this would just flatten the member variables so it would be title, rating, description. And since that is the same names as that, he can do it like that. I can't do it like that because I called this one differently, which does not make any sense. But I want to teach you that this stuff just maps to here, right? So this goes here, these two. It doesn't matter what name that is. I can name that anything. That was my whole point that I was trying to make here. It only needs to have the same name as what we put in when we encode. But other than that, it doesn't have any meaning. Good, I think I'm, I'm happy with my serialized function. I'm allocating a bit more space than our friend James does. But well, James just doesn't write as long reviews. That's, um, yeah, I guess, yeah. Class definition contains three of the four properties required. 
yeah, contains three. Oh, wait, no, he's talking about the fourth. Ah, okay, so, and variant is zero. That was the fourth. Variant is zero. Okay, so he starts counting at zero for his program instructions. Let's also do that then. Let's, if if the de the dev just told me that it's zero, so let's make it zero. We can use that directly with the spread operator. Aha, uh -huh, that's what this is called, okay. Spread some members. Finally, the method returns a new buffer that leaves off the unused portion of the original. Yeah, okay, that's done. Next up, sending transactions when a user submits the form. Now that we have the building blocks for the instruction data, we can create the send transaction. Open form and locate the handle transaction summary. Open the form and locate the handle transaction submit. For now, all that does is it locks my movie. My title, if I submit, it just locks this. And we already see, haha, we have the my Borsch schema as well as one of the member fields of movie, which I should have maybe probably made static. Did he make it static? No, but it would kinda, cause this, we don't need this per movie, we just need this once. So in my monkey brain, it would totally make sense to have this static, no? And then we also would just don't say this. And instead we say movie dot, right? I mean, that makes more sense in my head because then the flattening, like I didn't do it, but this stuff would also not add my, uh, my schema, so, if we do that again, now like now it looks a lot better, right? In my opinion, right? So it, we just lock the, the parts that are actually relevant here. Anyhow, we located that, okay. No, don't show the code. Well, yes, show the code, but don't read it yet. Inside this function, we'll be creating and sending the transaction that contains the data submitted to the form. Start by importing this and importing this and this and this and all the imports. No, I don't want to do this. I want to do it by myself again and then use the imports as I need them. So we want to get a connection. We want to get a connection and we don't want to get the connection every time. Keep it in the form and keep an open connection here. I don't know. Fine, I'm going to import it first. Damn it. It does compile. Maybe it's just my TypeScript, I don't know. Anyway, so we have a connection. I don't know how this went. Use wallet because it also doesn't show me what that provides, but okay, in that case, it's okay to copy code. Now I would just go back to the previous example and, and see, because I don't know that by heart yet. And I don't think that you need to know it by heart, right? This is stuff that you can look up. So I'm just gonna peek here and see that's how it's done. Okay, cool. It comes in this order. If I had the documentation of use wallet, then I could have seen this, but since I don't, we're just gonna copy it correctly. Okay, right, so that's that. What's next? Before we implement this, let's talk what needs to be done. We need to check that the public key exists so that we can prove that the wallet is connected. That makes sense. Call serialize on movie to get the buffer representing the instruction data. That's good. Let's do step by step. Step one, check that public key exists. So if not public key, because this is this, then return. So I like to just do it that way and not the opposite. So we don't need to do intendation and, and every intendation and everything. So. so if there's no public key, we say, nope, we're not even gonna bother with it. Well, okay, fine, fine, okay, we're gonna, yeah, you persuaded me, this is not nice. At least log that no wallet connected or whatever. Then serialize the movie to get buffer representation and instruction data. So my instruction data is from the movie that we receive, we call serialize and we get back a buffer. Perfect, we even have the correct types. Cool stuff. Next, create a new transaction object. Well, that's easy. Const transaction is a new 
transaction from Solana Web3. Yes, and here it automatically imports that. Perfect, I love it. Then, get out of the accounts that the transaction will read from or write to. Now, this is a bit more complicated. Accounts. You know, again, I don't need to know this by heart, but I need to know where to look it up. So what accounts do we need though? I don't know the program, so it's really hard to tell, but there will be some kind of like, I, I mean, I for sure need the public key. So that's like the user wallet itself, because this one will assign. And since it also pays for the transaction fee, it will definitely have to be immutable. So is writable set to true? That's the first account. And then we will need some movie account pub key that I don't yet know, which does not sign, but is writable because we will write that. I don't know yet what the address will be because I don't know what, how the program works and how it's derived and whatnot. So we'll just leave that empty for now. We'll say to do fix this. Do we need the system program as well? If we create the account, then we also need the system program. And I don't know if we do, but just in case, even if we don't need it, if we add it here, we just blow up our transaction for nothing, but program ID, as long as we set both of those things to false, there's not much that we lose, right? It's still, it's just, it's as if we provide more instruction data than we need. Like if we have another parameter there, like if we, if we put more bytes in there and just ignore it, that's, you know, you can add an account that you don't use. It's just, just the other way around is, is bad. If you need the account and you don't specify it, that is problematic. So just, for fun, because we don't know what our pro program actually does. And then create a new instruction that includes these accounts and includes the data and the program ID. Okay, we can do that. Program ID, oh, it's already up here, perfect. So we create a const instruction as the transaction instruction and you need keys, those are my accounts. You need program ID, that's my movie program ID. And that is just a string up here. So we need to make this a, a new public key. And then my data is, what did I call it? My instruction data. That's what we serialized in the movie class. And then add the instruction from the last step to the transaction. I mean, that's pretty obvious, which we'll is say transaction dot add instruction. Cool stuff. And then we call the send transaction, passing that const transaction ID is, send transaction, we imported that. And here we just give the transaction and we could add some commitments and whatnot, but I think just putting the transaction here is sufficient. But I can't tell because I don't have the types for this, which is annoying, but it is as it is. And then we console log the transaction ID just to have some output. Okay, cool. Now, this obviously does not work yet because we don't actually know which uh, movie account and whatnot to use, but let's see how badly we did. Oh, look, he also did it like that. If the pub key is not present, then we do that. Then we do movie serialize, create a transaction. Okay, now that, that there we go. That I did not know because I couldn't know because my dev didn't tell me yet. The next step is to get the accounts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This time the account address is more dynamic, so it needs to be computed. We'll cover this in depth in the next lesson. Okay, so PDAs are topic for the next lesson. I can accept this. I will not talk about PDAs now. I did already in previous videos, like not in this series, but like I've got a lot of videos that you can check out 
I've been making videos for over a year on Solana topics. So yeah, go check them out. But yeah, we need to find out which account we want to use. So this one I'm just gonna copy and we're gonna talk more about PDAs next time. So PDA in this case is just that. We don't need that anymore. And we find it by the following seeds, the public key, the movie title. Okay, so that movie title also is used. So for each person, for each, each wallet that writes the review, plus each title, we create a new account. And uh, this is the program. So the program ID by which we derive this, right? So it's a PDA for this program. That means this program owns this. And that means this program can write to this. We'll get to that next time probably. And then we add this account and yeah, the rest should then also be good. With that, we can finish the remaining steps. So that's the entire thing. Let's see if we did that correctly. We have the public key writable false. Are you kidding me, James? You set it to writable false? This ain't gonna work. I claim, I bet you this ain't gonna work, but maybe it does. We'll see. The PDA, which is not a signer, but writable. Yes, we have that. Not a signer, but writable. The program ID, which is false, false. A system program ID, false, false. Got that as well. The data is just a buffer. I called it differently, but it's... And then the program ID is the... Okay, this. Transaction add. And he did it... Oh! Oh, oh, there I see one more mistake that I have. I did not provide the connection, which obviously I need for this send transaction to work. And the connection I get from up here because I definitely spelled it correctly earlier. Boom, there we go. And he logs it a bit nicer. Yes, I log it simple. And he also does a try catch. If it fails, then my entire site just crashes. I'm okay with that because it just won't fail. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? I'm not a front end dev. I don't deal with it. Okay, that's it. Should now be able to use the form, submit the review. So actually with this code, this should already work. Let's check that. Let's check if it actually works. Okay, so my title, first we need to connect the wallet. I'm not gonna get into this. But if you, Phantom, yeah, I take this wallet, whatever, any wallet will do. So I connect my wallet, movie title, add your review, and a rating five out of five. And now we just submit this. I told you, what could possibly go wrong? Get recent block hash is not a function. Ah, I don't know what this does. Oh yeah, it's, uh, okay. Maybe that fixes that. No, I need to write my review again. I give it four stars. Well, that looks better. Doesn't simulate, but uh, we approve anyway. Oh, ah, no, stupid idiot. I locked the promise. I didn't await. So of course here we might want to await if we actually lock that and uh, thankfully the promise now already contains the result i can't really go anywhere else with that but you see that back here we have and since i didn't put such a nice link as james did i now manually have to navigate to devnet and copy my id in here but then i see that we created a transaction that hit the net and went through we paid for an account Right, so we're calling this program with three accounts. That's the data. Wow, it's that's logging a lot. Cool stuff. So that there we see the, the serialized data. And the only really interesting part that we can decode is this, because that's the, the variant and the rest is then variable. Because we then put the title. Like if seriously, if I were to do this, then I would put all the the, the fixed length things after each other. So I would do it like this, such that always the next byte is the stars because then always the second byte is the stars. If we have it like this, 
then my stars are like somewhere in there. In fact, they are, that's the length of the string. So 23. And if you don't understand what I'm doing here, then we'll get there next time, I think. So a string consists of four bytes of how long the string is. In our case, 23. So we would need to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 22, 23. And then, boom, the next one is the one byte for the rating, and that is four. So we found that as well. Just to give you a teaser of what we're gonna look at next time, because when we deserialize that, then we need to know this kind of a thing. Okay, cool. What else did it do? Fine. And then it called the system program to create that. And it locks my name, like my, my title. Yeah, nice. Nice, we called, like, we called the instruction. Now, one more thing though, I want to take James up on the bet that if I were to say false here, that this doesn't work anymore. Like, I'm so confident that this doesn't work anymore that I would give my Solana dev course a super shit review with one star. It works, really, really, really. But I gotta pay. I paid for this, so I need to be writable. And it even says I am writable. Just saying, it says I am writable. Maybe the library is smart enough. Okay, okay, I get it. I'm, I'm starting to understand. I'm starting to get it. This is exactly the difference between the accounts in the transaction versus the accounts in the instruction. Because for the instruction itself, it does not need to be writable, but for the whole transaction, it needs to be writable. So it makes sense that James says writable is false because for this individual instruction, but hey, even for this individual instruction, it should be true, right? Because this instruction also calls the system program which debits this account, which needs to have it. Yeah, this only works because it's also the signer. Just saying, James. I would, I would put this to true. Don't know where it's then set to true, but having it signed true and writable false. I mean, makes sense, but not if you're the only signer. Not if you're the first sign. Not if you're the fee payer. That's the thing. Not if you're the fee payer. Anyhow, that was my my little rent on that. Okay. It's getting late. My neighbors will complain if I keep talking. So again, I always say that you should write it yourself and not just copy the solution code. But the solution code is available. Now, for the challenge, before it's getting too late, it's my turn to build something independently. Well, I mean, I almost did that independently. <laughs> Create an application that lets students of this course introduce themselves. So again, this is pretty much the literal same, except that we now have the variant, a name, which is a string and the message, which is a string. So just one number less, no rating, but the rest is pretty much one to one the same. James just makes us do this. James just makes you do this because you might not have already done it in this way of first reading it and then doing it yourself. But I, I did. So doing it one more time, I think it's not really valuable. I would, however, now that we did it together again, encourage you to do this one yourself though. As a homework, this is a good exercise for you, I judge. I don't know you personally, but like, if you watch this video till here, I would now recommend that you go try this yourself. There is the starter code here, the template, and uh, you can just go through this. And uh, there's also a solution available, so shouldn't cause any issues. Yeah, and also get creative, do your own thing, build your entire own thing, build whatever you want, right? Now that we are so smart, and know how to serialize with Borsch. Next time, we're gonna learn how to deserialize because that is then the other way around. We have the data somewhere and then we need to read it again to put it in a convenient way to work 
with our program. That's for next time. I'm really looking forward to this one because this is actually really fun to do on the one hand and you kind of need it a lot. Like in my experience as a Solana dev, this is like 50% of what I'm doing. Well, maybe, you, you know, but like I do it a lot and it's super important to understand how this works. Also super important to know how the serializing works, but now we already know this. So looking forward to going through the deserialization with you next time. Next time? There will be no next time. Of course there will be a next time. Look how many parts we still have to go through. If you want there to be a next time, definitely give this video a like. Tell me in the comments that you enjoy this content to keep me motivated to make those videos. If you have any remaining questions, also leave them in the comments or in my Discord or in the Solana Stack Exchange. Yeah, I just wish you happy coding, happy learning. And I hope you don't get frustrated with stuff not working because it doesn't always just work. But therefore, it's much more rewarding if it then finally actually works. All right. And with that, I want to leave you. Check out those other videos and I will see you next time. Where we do this, that then we can do this, that then we can do this. And then we're almost done with module one.